The rhythm of the world and the rhythm of the kingdom of heaven are in dissonance with one another. They don't come together, they don't fit, but they always are opposed to one another. And we live in this constant state of a tug between two different worlds, and sometimes our flesh wants to go rogue and beat for a rhythm that we were never created for, one that is opposed to the kingdom of heaven, a rhythm that will end up in our destruction, one that is opposed to the very kingdom that calls us to walk in step with. Galatians 5, 16 says, but I say to you, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I said it last week, for the desires of the flesh, the rhythm of the flesh is against the rhythm of the spirit. And the desires of the rhythm of the spirit is against the desires of the rhythm of the flesh. These two kingdoms, they live opposed to one another. So the choice is, or the question is, which rhythm will we choose, the spirit or the flesh? We cannot serve two masters. It's impossible. We cannot beat to two different rhythms. There will be dissonance. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Today we're diving into Spirit Week Part 2. And how when the Spirit comes into our life, He causes us to beat to the rhythm of heaven's drum. And anytime we are talking about Pentecost, you know exactly where we're going to start at in the scripture where at where in the bible no go to genesis chapter one so genesis chapter one verse one that's where we're going to launch out of today genesis chapter one in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. So this earth is round, this sphere that's filled with nothing, nothingness. It's without form. It's void. And it's completely dark. Dark was over the face of the deep. But watch this. And God's spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. I love it. God's spirit is in the very midst of that void darkness that is there. God's spirit's not a not far away from it. He draws right up close to it. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. In the beginning of time, God creates everything. The earth without form. The earth is void. It's dark. Darkness is everywhere. And God looked into this vast array of nothing. And not just made something out of nothing, but made everything out of nothing. Church, sometimes we can feel like our lives look like nothing, right? That it's a mess, it's chaotic, it's formless, it's void. And if God can look into all of creation and create everything out of nothing, how much more can he create something out of the nothingness of our life? We're never too far gone. We're never too far dark. We're never too far void for him to speak into. And yet God's spirit was hovering over the face of the deep. It kind of sounds like our life before Christ, formless, void, dark. And God's spirit was hovering. Aren't you thankful that no matter how far we may run, no matter how far deep into sin or brokenness or formlessness or void we may be, God is not far off from us, but God's spirit is hovering over us. Amen. The psalmist said it this way, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I go into the depths of the sea, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths of Sheol, even there your hand is with me. Aren't you thankful that we can't run far enough away where God's presence cannot find us in the most broken and dark situation? Come on, we said it a few weeks ago. God didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And sometimes we're dead in the midst of our trespasses and our sin and our brokenness. And God speaks the very word of life. And God speaks the very word of light and calls that life forth out of darkness. Aren't you thankful? He's not scared. He's not put off by the darkness that we get into in life. 
But he gets right up into the midst of it. His spirit starts hovering in it. And then he begins to work. And as God spoke to the darkness then and brought order to the chaos, it's the exact thing of what he will do within our lives. He will speak and light will come forth and bring order to the chaos of our lives. Amen. Church, when we begin to beat to the rhythm of our own drum. We're formless and void, but when we begin to beat to the rhythm of the kingdom, things begin to change. This is exactly why we need the baptism of the Spirit, because the Spirit causes us to beat to a drum that is not the drum of this world, but to the rhythm of the kingdom of heaven. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, but you will receive power When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Three things that we're going to explore real quickly that happened at Pentecost. Number one, spirit baptism, the rhythms. Number two is the power that God gave. Number three is the witnessing. When the early church was baptized by Holy Spirit, a new rhythm was set in motion. The church was distinguishably different post-Pentecost as opposed to immediately post-Easter, right? There was a distinguishment that came along the early church, or the early church was distinguished post-Pentecost. And church, when we are baptized by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives us a completely different rhythm of life because the Spirit's baptism changes and transforms us, and it causes us to beat in heaven's rhythm. I love what Apostle Rayleigh says, that the Holy Spirit does not make us better than others. The Holy Spirit makes us better than ourselves. And the whole goal is not of the Holy Spirit to look and say, man, well, we got a lot more power than that person sitting beside us or that person down the pew from us. But no, the Holy Spirit is to make me a better me. Jesus said, it is to your good that I go away. For if I don't go away, I will not send you another comforter, the Spirit who will guide you into all truth. And we need to be guided into all truth, especially when there's so much ambiguity in our world around us today. Right? People don't know whether things are truth or false. It's, it's crazy. And we need that spirit to guide us into all truth. And so he's not available for us to make us better than others. It's not about us having some outer form body experience. It's not about an emotional experience. Or experience. It's about us having power to be his witnesses. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses. The first thing Luke mentions in reference to the baptism of the Spirit is power. The Greek word, which many of you have heard over and over in in Pentecost Sunday, the Greek word here for power is dunamis. Everybody say dunamis with me. It's dunamis. The emphasis on dunamis in the Greek language, the emphasis is on a functional power. How many of y'all have a power tool? that sits in a cabinet at home that is only used about two times a year. Come on, right? Uh, There's a lot of us that have power tools, powered equipment that collects more dust than it does use, right? And the emphasis of functional power is not for that power tool to sit on a shelf collecting dust. The emphasis is about when that power tool is doing what it was created to do. It's ratcheting down, it's sawing. That's where the emphasis of this power is, is the functional, the utility, the usefulness that it was created for. And how many of you know that when we receive that power, we are not meant to sit as a relic on a shelf in a garage somewhere. But the power that we were given was for us to be set into motion, to have an active power that leads us to change, that leads us to transform things, that leads us to do things different than it was the way it was done before. Most all humans love power. We have this innate desire to have power, to be in control, to make things happen. But this is not the power that Luke is referencing. Why don't you pull out your towel for me real quick. See, the power that Luke is referencing is not a power to control, but it's a power to serve. 
And when God gives us this power, it's not here to just create hype. And I know we had physical hype and all that, and that was fun. But it's not the same thing when the Holy Spirit comes on us. Right? There's a complete difference when the Spirit of God comes from what we just had a moment ago to right here. When the Spirit of God comes on us, He gives us a completely different power to do things that we don't have power to do. Right? We need power we don't have to do things that we cannot do in and of ourselves, church. And this power comes alongside so that we can use, we can use it to serve tables. We can use it to wash feet. Jesus laid aside his earthly garments and he humbled himself and he began to wash the feet of the disciples. It's a towel that we can utilize to clothe the naked, right? To cover those that are broken. It's a towel that is meant for us to serve. A towel to greet. A towel to serve in kids' town. A towel to serve in, as an usher. A towel to serve on parking lot days when it's raining or when it's hot, right? A towel to do things that are opposed to the flesh. And we all have these things that are in opposition to our flesh that we don't want to do. But that's why we have the power of God. is to be able to do those things that we cannot do in and of ourselves. Jesus, what did he do? He laid aside all of the royalty of heaven. And he became a servant. He humbled himself. To the point of death, even death on a cross. He served because the Spirit of God gave him a power that was, that was an enabling power. Spirit Week is all about creating energy, right? Spirit Week is all about creating this hype and this pep. And if we had a dollar for every time we heard the words good energy in our society. Right? Everybody loves to talk about good energy or positive energy or that's negative energy. I don't want to be around that. How many ever heard that? That's bad energy might be a Gen Z thing. That's bad energy. I don't want to be around that kind of... Everybody loves to be talking about energy, but there's only one who is able to give us this positive energy that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit, right? In Spirit Week and in Homecoming Week, the goal of hype was to raise the... or, or what the goal of the energy was to raise the level of hype that would transmit into a W on Friday night. But church, the whole goal of spirit baptism is to turn our lives into a W for the kingdom of heaven. A life that is winning for the kingdom of heaven. A life that is driving back the powers of darkness. A life that says, God, here I am, send me. I am here to do what you want me to do. Whatever it is, you have my yes. Worldly power can kill, but God's power brings to life. Amen? See, God's power can make the lame to walk. God's power can make the blind to see. God's power can make the deaf to hear. God's power can cause strongholds and generational bondage and generational curses to drop off the lives of those that are around us if we will walk within the dunamis, the power that God has made available to us as his church. And this is the power that God wants to place within our lives. The reality is, church, we are desperate for this power. It's not a power that we can get on our own. And it means without the power of the Spirit, without the baptism of the Spirit, we are powerless. We are powerless. We are void without the baptism of the Spirit. Case in point, Peter. Peter was a man that spent three years of his life with Jesus. Peter knew Jesus. Peter loved Jesus. Peter went out, was on mission with Jesus where he healed and he delivered. He set free. They sent the 70 out and they returned and said, even the demons and spirits are subject to us. And I mean, Peter saw all of these great things happen. But when the rubber hit the road and it came to crucifixion time, Peter dipped out on Jesus, right? And he ran. And not only did he run after the crucifixion, but after the resurrection... Where does it say the disciples were? They were locked in for fear of the Jews. So this man who knew Jesus, loved Jesus, was saved by Jesus, saw all that Jesus did. Sounds like a lot of Christians. We know Jesus. We love Jesus. We are saved by Jesus. But so often we stay locked in for fear of those people out there. Right? We're just like Peter. We stay locked in. But there was a remarkable, a distinguishable difference post-Pentecost with Peter than there was with pre-Pentecost. 
See, the same crowds that had just all killed off Jesus were still in Jerusalem. But Peter, he was a part of the 120 on that Pentecost Sunday. And when the Spirit of God rushed into that room and the cloven tongues of fire set on their lives, Peter received a power that was not of this world. And the same crowds that crucified Jesus, Peter got up and he stood up in front of them and he began to preach, thus saith the Lord of hosts, repent, repent. And these people, they came and they laid down their lives and thousands were added to the early church in that moment. Case in point, why we need the power of the spirit. We need the powers, the spirit of the, the Holy Spirit's power. There we are. Told you I can't do two things at once. To overcome our greatest fears. And when we overcome that fear, we will live on mission for God's kingdom. And we will be his witnesses. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. If you'll put it up on the screen for me. But you will receive power. You will receive, what's the Greek word? Dunamis. You will receive dunamis. When the Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Everybody say witnesses. I've heard the word dunamis and power developed so many times, but I don't remember often hearing or really ever hearing the word witness develop. And I asked my mom before service, and I said, have you ever heard the term witness or the word, uh, a word study on the word witness? And she said, no, I hadn't heard that before today. Um, you will receive dunamis and you will be my witness. The Greek word for witness is martus. Is martus. This is where we get our English word martyr from. You can see why there's not a lot of word studies done there. Right? You will receive dunamis and you will be my martus. It gets real real quick. Right? It gets real real quick when you start getting into the text and you start looking beneath the text, see, Martus, Martus is a, a the, the word means to affirm or to attest, one who is willing to testify or to bear witness. It's also where we get our English word martyr from. And when you look at the background of the early church and you realize that 11 of the 12 disciples were all martyred, it deepens the meaning of this text, right? It richens the meaning of this text when you will receive dunamis and you will be my martyrs. See, God is calling us to have a power that's on our lives to enable us to lay down our lives regardless of the cost, to be his witness, to be those who are willing to attest, to be those who will bear witness about his name. When you think of a courtroom setting and a judge calls on a witness to take the stand, that's what God is calling on us to be willing to do, to take the stand in life, to be willing to testify, to shout it from the rooftops that he is Lord of all creation. And the reality is most of us would prefer not to have to take that stand in life, to be in front of that courtroom setting. But what if that's the very reason that God gives us the dunamis so that we can be his martyrs? It's, it's against human nature for us to take this risk, a risk that would end in the possibility of martyrs, right? We see it with the disciples. They were locked down and they ran from. It's, it's, it's every bit of human nature to run from pain. It's every bit of human nature to run from discomfort, to avoid those things. And so when, when, when it got real thick and real heavy for the disciples, they locked down in fear because they didn't want to be a Martus at that moment. But Jesus said you will receive Martus. Or I mean you will receive power so that we will be his witnesses. Typically we live in self-preservation mode. We live in self-preservation mode, which is exactly why we need the baptism of the Spirit to have his power, to be his witnesses. Like Peter, we cannot do it on our own and when we're beating to the rhythm of our own drum, when we are without the Holy Spirit, when we are without the power of God, we will be in dissonance to the kingdom of God. But when we receive the baptism of the Spirit, it sets us in motion to a rhythm that creates habits, that gives us strength and gives us power to do the things that he's called called us to do in this life. And this is exactly what took place on Pentecost. Worship team, if you would go ahead and come to the stage. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. 
And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire. And divided tongues of fire set on each one of them. And it rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues. Now, because of the feast, the Pentecost, there were Jews or people that were dwelling in Jerusalem. Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Right? It was a pilgrimage feast. Much like Passover was a pilgrimage feast and everybody came to Jerusalem at Passover time, Pentecost is the same type of feast where all of the Jewish people from all over the world, they come to Jerusalem at this time. And so there's all of these people that are there, Jews from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, this multitude came together. They were bewildered, they were confused, they were in amazement. Because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed. They were astonished. Saying, are not these who are speaking Galileans? Are these not who are speaking Galileans? We know from other texts that the Galileans were referred to as the uneducated. Are not these people uneducated? But yet, we hear them proclaiming the mighty works of God all in our own language talk about a spirit week or a, a pep rally some of y'all thought today was a little bit crazy but when the Holy Spirit fell and hit Jerusalem things went sideways real quick right the whole community thought these people aren't crazy they're drunk they're inebriated they're intoxicated what is going on all of these people that are here doing this what is going on? And Peter's like, uh-uh, this is not that. But this is what Peter prophesied, that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And when God showed up, everyone heard the same exact message in their own native tongue. Church, this is why I had you wear your team colors today. If you would go ahead and stand with me. I mentioned it earlier. Today we have nations represented in this room from all over the face of this world. Our team colors show that we all come from different tribes. We come from different backgrounds. We come from different walks of life. And there is beauty in diversity. Thank God for the diversity that is in the body of Christ. And we celebrate the diversity. I love the diversity makeup. I love our family's a biracial family. I love diversity. I love diversity and I'm thankful and I'm proud of the diversity of this house. But what I love even more, even though we celebrate every language, tribe, and tongue here, the message of the gospel was the same for every single one of them the gospel was for all and not only was the gospel for all but the baptism of the spirit was for all this is why i love the gospel message so much because the gospel brings us from all of our different tribes our high schools our colleges that we are in all of our alma maters all of the walks of life and languages and tongues and country background it brings all of us together under one banner whose name is jesus and when we get under that banner there's great unity there's great unity in the body. And not only does he call us to come under the banner of Christ Jesus, but as we get under this banner of Christ Jesus, he then anoints us with the power of the Holy Spirit and says, hey, who else can take this beautiful, diversified group and send them out with the same message? Church, we can't get along on anything nowadays. But when we come together under the banner of Christ Jesus and we lay aside every bit of diversity and background and we run with the same gospel message that salvation is for all, this gospel message is for all, he's not willing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance. This is the beauty of the gospel. It is for everyone, for everywhere. But you shall receive power and you shall be my witness God's brilliant they didn't need social media they didn't need technology they didn't have any of that 
to start this movement. But he brought people from all over the face of the world into one common area in his omnipotence. It's where they heard Passover, the salvation message. 50 days later, they heard about Pentecost and they saw the fruit of Pentecost. And what do you think happened? That place catapulted back to the nations of the earth. You're not gonna believe what just took place in Jerusalem. You're not gonna believe what we just saw. You're not gonna believe what we just heard. You're not gonna believe what we just witnessed. What we just witnessed. And it mobilized, it gave wheels to the gospel like was never had before. But you will receive power and you will be my witness. Church, God's call is the same exact call for us today. Not to sit on a dusty shelf, but to take this power and to be his witness. To take the stand in every day, every hour, every walk of life. And let people know that the gospel message is for everyone, everywhere question is will we right the choice is will we will we with everybody's head bowed and eyes closed this morning when the Holy Spirit comes upon our life he causes us to beat to a different rhythm he gives us power that we can't get on our own to do things we can't do on our own which is why we need that towel to serve I know some of you here today you might say well I need the gospel message for step one and for starters, I, I need his salvation in my own life. I need his transformation in my own life. And God's here. He's calling unto you. And with everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, I want us to just pray this prayer together of surrendering our lives to Jesus. Say, Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you that you came into this world and you laid down your life. Father, I ask that you would forgive me of all of my sins, that you would be Lord of my life, and that you would help me to live for you. Let me have the power of your spirit to invade my life, to live on mission in your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate those that surrendered or dedicated, rededicated their lives to Jesus today. I'm going to ask you if you would all come down to the front. It's Pentecost Sunday. And we're not going to conclude this service without going after the power of the Spirit. And if you need hands laid on you, if you need prayer, uh, altar team, if you would come down at this point too, I want us to pray for you. If you want God's presence to fill your life or you're desperate for the Holy Spirit, I want you to just keep both of your hands held up. And our prayer team, we're going to come by and we're going to anoint I'm going to ask all of our altar team and pastors and deacons, if you just anoint every person that comes down, if you need prayer for anything, you can whisper in their ear and they will pray with you. But we're here today to get in and to go after the Spirit of God. So I want you to get, down, get out from out of your seats. Come on down to the front and let's pray together as the worship team leads us in prayer. We'll close out in just a few moments.